Are you a starter or a finisher? If you don't know what I'm talking about, then think about the YouTube videos you've watched in the last week. How many did you start and how many did you finish? Or if you're a homeowner, think about the home projects you've done in the last 10 years. How many did you start? How many did you finish? I'm a chronic starter. Last May, I began updating our master bathroom to change the color tones from beige to gray. I began with the floor and I got that done in a couple of days. Next was the countertop and backsplash. Now my wife, Rachel, ordered all the supplies from Home Depot and had them delivered. And they've now sat in our garage for almost a whole year untouched. I am definitely a starter. My wife, on the other hand, is a finisher. We recently got a puppy. His name is Marlo, which is the name of my hometown, and he is a mini Labradoodle. As part of his training, my wife has been attending puppy school. And let's just say for a variety of reasons, it hasn't been the best experience. After week three, she came home totally frustrated. So because I'm a starter and not a finisher, what did I tell her to do? Quit. I said, don't worry about the money or all the next three weeks, it's just not worth your time. But my wife is a finisher. So come hell or high water, she was determined to see that class through to the end. And she did. And it didn't get any better. So I think I was right, but I'm not gonna tell her that. Are you a starter or a finisher? My name is Ellis, I'm one of the pastors at Chapel Hill, and you're joining us in a new series called Joy No Matter What, based upon a letter that the first century church leader Paul wrote to the church in the Greek city of Philippi. As Pastor Mark shared with us in our last video, this was Paul's sweetheart church. He spoke so fondly of them in his letter. And one of the major themes is joy, joy no matter what. And in this video, I will seek to bring a message of joy to you as I address the question, is God a starter or a finisher? My hope is that in the next few minutes, as you hear the answer to that question and the implications for your faith, you will be encouraged in your faith journey and find more joy in your life. So let's take a look at what Paul writes to the church in Philippi, beginning with the third verse of the very first chapter. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Well, as we did hear from Pastor Mark in that last video, Paul begins his letter by exuding his gratitude for the church in Philippi. Whenever he thinks about them, he thanks God and he finds joy. Why? because they've been partners with him in the work of proclaiming the good news about Jesus from, from the very first day that he arrived in Philippi over 10 years ago. And then comes the answer to the question I posed just a minute ago. Is God a starter or a finisher? Here's what Paul writes. He says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. A few weeks ago, Gunnar Tesdahl, our director of worship, exclaimed in one of our services that here at Chapel Hill, we're Calvinists. Now, I'll be honest, we gave him a bit of a hard time over it because I don't think we've ever called ourselves Calvinists in the past. And it's one of those terms that has been abused a lot over the years. But in truth, we do trace our, the heritage of our beliefs back to a man named John Calvin, who lived in Switzerland in the 16th century. Now that is what I call a beard. Calvin was one of the leaders of what we call the European Reformation, a movement to reform the church. And from his beliefs developed something that we now call Calvinism. And in case you're wondering what it means to be a Calvinist, there's a helpful floral-based acronym that's been used for around 100 years to help articulate the key beliefs. TULIP. Each of the letters of the word tulip standing for one of the five key beliefs of this system. Now you can go Google it later if you want to learn more about it, but the final letter of tulip, the P, stands for something that we call the perseverance of the saints. And Paul's statement that we just read, 
and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. That statement is the basis upon which we develop that belief in the perseverance of the saints. And put simply, that belief is this. God is a finisher. I wonder when it was that you first saw God at work in your life. Maybe it's something that you're sensing right now for the first time. I remember when I was 18, sensing God's work in a very real way in my life. It was a a one, two, three combo over the course of a weekend. Friday, I was at a party in the Hellfire Caves in my hometown, and I had a friend invite me to come to church. Saturday, I had a very bad night out with some friends that left me feeling totally empty. And on Sunday, my parents dragged me to visit a church they like to go to a few times a year. And in the midst of my hangover headache, as I was singing to the songs in in that church, I began to sense that in the last few days, God had begun a work in me that was going to change me. I can look back on that weekend as a time when God began a very real work of transformation in my life. When was the first time you recall God working in your life? Because I have some good news for you. If you can recall a time when God began his work in your life, or or if you're sensing it right now, then I can guarantee that he will finish that work. Why? Because God is a finisher. God finishes what he started. As Paul writes, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. God will finish what he starts. If he has begun a work of salvation in your life, then you can know for sure he will finish it. But let's be honest. There are times in our life when that's hard to believe, right? Times when if we did an honest stock take of the way we are living, we might doubt whether we are really following Jesus at all. Perhaps you've been there. Perhaps you're there right now. Times when we've been gripped by anxiety or depression. I was speaking to a friend the other day who lived with constant anxiety throughout two years of his life. He prayed and prayed and prayed, but nothing seemed to take it away. Or perhaps a time in your life when you've been gripped by an addiction to something you cannot stop. Maybe it was alcohol or prescription medication or social media or spending money or porn. I recall a young man in my small group in college who said, I've just resolved that I will never be free from porn. I know there are times in our life when it can be hard to believe that God will finish what he started, when it feels like the faith that began so strong is is wavering. And if it isn't in your life, maybe it's in the life of one of your children, a a child who you brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, who, who seems to have walked away. It can be hard to believe that God will finish what he started when we look at the state of our lives or the lives of our kids. John Bunyan was another old dead guy named John. He he lived in 17th century England and wrote one of the most popular works of fiction in the history of humanity. It's called The Pilgrim's Progress. It's the story of a man named Christian who journeys from his hometown, the city of destruction, to the celestial city atop Mount Zion. And it's an allegory of our journey of faith. At one point, Christian meets a man named Interpreter, whose goal it is to teach Christian the crucial truths he will need for his journey of faith. At one point, Interpreter shows Christian a fire burning against a wall with someone pouring water constantly upon it, trying to put it out. And yet the flames of the fire keep burning higher and higher. Christian asks interpreter, what does it mean? And and he explains, he says, the fire is the work of God's grace in our hearts. And the one trying to douse the flames with water is the devil. But what we don't see on the backside of the wall is the reason that the flames keep getting higher and higher. You see, on the backside is a man pouring oil continuously into the fire, making the flames go higher and higher. And that man is Jesus. You see, whatever might be happening on our side of the wall, whatever Satan might be doing to try and quench the work of God's grace in your heart or the heart of your child, there is Jesus hidden from our sight, 
pouring his oil of grace out continuously upon the work of God in our life. Nothing can stop the flame from burning higher and brighter. No temptation of the world or the flesh or the devil, no no indwelling sin in our heart. Nothing can prevent the work that God began from being finished. God is a finisher. And do you know what that means? The best is yet to come. Whatever you might be facing right now, whatever the devil is trying to do to stop the work of God in your life, whatever temptations you might be trying to overcome, our God is going to finish what he started. The best is yet to come. Your future is better than your past. Your end is better than your beginning. Your tomorrow is better than your today. That flame is going to burn higher and brighter and stronger and cleaner because Jesus is the one who's providing the fuel. I am sure of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know there are some of you listening for whom this is going to be a little bit easier to latch on to. And then there are some others who are going to find it hard to believe in what I'm saying. Because right now the fire looks like it's about to be quenched. And you're not sure you're going to make it through the next week with your faith intact, let alone to the end of time. Well, this is where God has not designed us to do faith by ourselves. God has designed us to do faith together in community. You see, I wonder if the original recipients of Paul's letter, those Christians living 2,000 years ago in Philippi, I wonder if they were beginning to doubt if they would make it. And then along came this letter from Paul with this total assurance that they were in fact going to make it. You know, after the verses I read earlier, Paul writes this. He says, it's right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. You ever have a moment where you start thinking about a person almost randomly and and then maybe you start praying for them because you know that they're going through something right now and, and maybe you even send them a short message to encourage them. We might say something like, God placed you on my heart this morning. Have you ever had that? Well, that's what Paul is describing here. The Philippians have been on Paul's heart and he dearly loves them. And so he's reaching out to them to let them know. And more than just reaching out to them to to let them know that he loves them, he's praying for them. And he shares with them what his prayer is. He, He says this, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The Philippians have been on Paul's heart and he's writing to let them know that he's praying for them, that they might grow in their love and purity and righteousness so that on that day of Christ, they might be the finished work. Do you notice how Paul's prayer ties together with his earlier statement about God finishing what he started. Paul's taking the truth that the best is yet to come and he's praying it for his friends on their behalf in case they don't have the faith to believe it right now. Praying that they might see God's work of grace in their life grow more and more, that that their love might grow, that they might become purer, that they might be filled with the fruit of righteousness, that they might see that the best is yet to come. And maybe those of us who are, are grasping this truth easily, the truth that the best is yet to come, maybe we are being called to be like Paul and to reach out to people we might know in our life who might be struggling to believe that same truth, to people who might be doubting if they're going to make it, and to encourage them, like Paul did, to pray for them, to have faith for them, even when they can't have it for themselves. And so, who might it be that God's placing on your heart right now? Who might you need to begin praying for and encouraging because they just don't know whether they're going to make it or not? And maybe you can send them a message right now and let them know. 
Maybe in fact, you are one of those people who needs encouragement today. You've heard me when I've said the best is yet to come, but you are really struggling to believe it. There's just too much weighing you down for you to believe that it could be true. And if that's you, I want to pray for you right now. The same prayer that Paul prays for the Philippians. Would you let me do that? Father, I pray for any person watching this who's struggling to believe that their faith is going to make it. I pray that they would see you at work in their life, finishing what you've started. I pray that you may be at work in them right now by your Holy Spirit, so that their love for you and others will flourish, and that they will not only love much, but love well. Would you encourage them today in whatever it is that they are going through, that the best is yet to come? I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. And if you love these videos, feel free to check out all the links in the description below. Also, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. We will see you in the next video.